Hello everybody, I'm Don Counts and we're here at the uh, Warrior Project here in Fayetteville, the Warrior Exhibit, uh, where there is a pictorial history of many of the people who have served in Fayetteville and Lincoln County, uh, their pictures across here. I have Linda Williams with me and today our guest is Mr. Jack Buck. How you doing? Good afternoon, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. And uh, my picture's on the wall too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody about yourself and uh, what led you into the military. Okay, uh, my dad uh, was in the Navy during World War II, and he was on ships. And he used to tell me all these stories about the Navy. And uh, I went to school in Flintville, graduated in 64. But leading up to that, I used to read Boy's Life magazines, Look magazines, and I saw all these places around the world I wanted to go to. That is why I joined the military. I wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. I wanted to see, I actually volunteered to go to Paris, France. I didn't get it. But uh, when I graduated in 64, I was literally gone for 40 years and I came back in 2004. My cousin, I finally decided I was going in the Navy. My cousin, Terry Holman, there used to be, a lot of people don't know it, there was a bus stop right down the street here. I took him to the bus station. He got on the bus, took off to the Air Force, and I joined the Air Force after that. I couldn't, I followed him. So we were together in, in basic training, and uh, in, the, in basic training they assigned you a job. My job was gonna be a typewriter jockey. Uh, and I thought, well, I didn't join up for this, but I did it for several years. And then uh, when my experiences about Vietnam rolled around, uh, I was in California and I decided to cross train to be a loadmaster so he could fly all the time. That's what I would like to do, be a pilot. Of course, I wasn't a pilot, but we flew. So in, in Travis Air Force Base, as a loadmaster, I flew in big C-141 aircraft. We would fly uh, from Travis and we'd head west. And uh, I, I used to be gone a week, 10 days. We'd hit Hawaii, sometimes spend the night in Hawaii. We'd go on to Guam, never spent the night in Guam. Then from there into the Philippines. You stay in the Philippines a week, flying out of Vietnam every day, every day. We'd, we'd fly people in, we'd fly equipment in, and we'd bring people and equipment out. Uh, in 1973, at the end of the war, I was actually standing on a flight line, loading people up, because the war was ending, and a bunch of people ran up with cameras and started taking pictures of us. And I said, what's all this going on? They said, well, we have to tell the people in the United States that the war is over. We have to tell people that you are the last plane out of Vietnam. Because we got to pick a plane and you're it. You're the last plane out of Vietnam. I said, okay, but look, there's planes everywhere out here. He said, well, it doesn't matter. We got to tell the people in the States something. So 40 years later, I found that video on YouTube. It's out there today. It's, you know, if you ever look at it, it's called The Last U.S. Troops Leave Vietnam. And I, I pull it up and look at it every now and then. But I had to show it to all my buddies and friends. You know, they said, Jack, you're, you're the local hero. So you, you're you, in the video? You close. Yeah, it's, I've got it. It's on. I showed it to my buddy, and I get on the airplane, load everybody on. And once or twice, I've shown that video on, on around on the Internet. And I've had people go, wow, there's my dad in that video. He's getting on the airplane. <laughs> wow, I know that guy. And it's a good feeling to hear that people say, you know, they knew the people getting on the airplane. I've never met anybody that got on there with me and left, but uh, yeah. that's just the way it is. We, when we landed in Vietnam, they didn't want us to stay very long because it's a big, huge four-inch jet, and it draws fire, you know, from the hills. So we'd load up, do our thing, and fly to Thailand or something, or fly back to Clark, spend the night, and do it all over the next day. Uh, one, I loaded up probably 150 people one time 
toward the end of the war. And uh, it's funny, but it wasn't funny. This doctor come up to me, he was a major. He said, he said, Sarge, you got anywhere I can let this guy lay down? I go, why? He says, and I'm quoting, he says, I just cut his hemorrhoids out with a pair of scissors. Oh. <laughs> and I said, okay, <laughs> let me, as soon as we take off, he can get up in the crew bunk and sleep. And we took those guys to Yakota, Japan, and dropped them off. And, uh, you know, but. He needed to lay down, I'm sure. <laughs> it was a place to <laughs> yeah, lay down right. up there. And, <laughs> and, but, and they were, they were getting on with bottles of booze and, you know, and the other, the other load master said, look, they can't do that. They can't get on here carrying all that booze. I said, well, are you going to stop them? I'm not. They're out of the war. They're going home. Leave them alone. So. So that was mostly who you were transporting out was or well not all the time we I had uh, uh, I had the honor of bringing back caskets with our heroes in them. That was tough. That was tough. You know. And uh, you know, you, you watch it on TV now today. They had their flag draped. When I did it, there was no flags. I even asked some of my buddies out that used to fly with me, when did they start putting flags on the coffins? And we're not too sure. But when we did it in the 70s, it was just a big tin metal coffin. And wherever we would fly to, if it was Hickam. They'd unload them. If you, you know, we get back to the states, they'd unload them, and there was never any ceremonies like, like you see now, where they 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 come out and uh, uh, and uh, people meet in the airplane and all that. I never saw that one time. I just saw them. They were those caskets were on a pallet that we loaded with a forklift and slid them all the way up into the airplane. And uh, I brought back, you know. A few of those. And then when you go look at the wall, you wonder whose name up there, the ones I brought back. And it was tough. Still is. You know, 48 years ago, and I still get emotional over it. But, you know, it was, it was what we did. We, uh, we were gone. When I leave my, left my family in California, we were there. We were gone a week, 10 days at a time. Fly back home just long enough to sit three days off and go back to Vietnam again. And uh, I did that all the way up until uh, I started mid-summer of 72 to mid-summer of 75. And the war was over by then. And then uh, they sent me to England. And I was in a pararescue outfit with the PJs. On a different type of aircraft and different mission, but you know, Vietnam was a, uh, it was it was memorial. It, it's you don't, it, it's you don't remember everything, because the last time I was over there was God forty something years ago, but uh, you know, I still talk with some of my friends that was with me over there. They're stationed, you know, all over the world now, or, or they're out of the military, but we were uh, that was our job flying. We didn't only go to Southeast Asia, we flew all over the world. <laughs> I literally got to see the world like I wanted to when I joined up, you know. Uh, sometimes you see on, the, on Facebook, pick all these places you've been, these countries you've been to. Look, I've been to five or six. I had, I had to count the ones I hadn't been to. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't spend a night there, but you know, you land in Egypt, uh, we landed in Jakarta, Dakota, and, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia, I mean, and picked up a peacekeeping uh, airplane full of people, called them a, a peacekeeping group, take them to uh, uh, Cairo, Egypt, and drop them off back during the, when they had the war going on over there. We, we were there helping those guys out. Uh, you had a lot of time in the in the air. Did you ever was you ever in a situation where you was in a dangerous situation? 
Well, no, not really. I mean, other than you land and the wheels catch on fire, stuff like that every now and then. But, you know. Sounds we, bad. As far as I know, <laughs> we never got shot at, but we never would know. Yeah. I mean, there were stories. It didn't happen to me, but, you know, the they'd load up and be flying out of Vietnam or Thailand somewhere and look back there and one one story was it was a big huge cobra snake up on a pallet just looking around uh, you know <laughs> uh, another little uh, a little I thought it was a funny story when you sit on a 141 airplane you face backward maybe people don't realize that but you do so we had a load of troops coming out of I, I want to say Thailand it might have been Vietnam, I don't remember, a long time ago. But all the baggage are stacked up on the on the ramp. And when you raise it up, of course, the ramp is up like this. Mm -hmm. Well, we raised it up. Out come a little vial, about that long, full of white powder. Oh. <laughs> and uh, the other loadmaster, he says, let me see that. He looked at it. He said, he said, watch this. He started walking up all these military guys is this yours this yours they were all just turning their heads away <laughs> nobody wanted to talk about it so i take it up to the aircraft commander and i told him what that is he said oh my gosh jack if if we report this they'll unload this airplane the customs people will come in here the mps will come in here they'll strip this airplane out we won't get out of here for days and uh, he said it might not even be real stuff that was the aircraft commander. The uh, the second in command, uh, the, he was a lieutenant. He was in the right seat. He said, let me see that. He goes, oh, that's the real stuff. Oh. And I, <laughs> I, said, I, well, I said, well, <laughs> he was a co-pilot. <laughs> and the pilot said, said Jack, that stuff, we're going to be here for a long time. If you report it, or if I have to call it in. I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, th that stuff, if we report it, it's going to be here for a long time. And it dawned on me. I said, what stuff? He said, exactly, let's get the hell out of here. I took it, plucked it down a commode on the airplane. <laughs> oh, gee. And it was gone. But, you know, that's just the things that happen. You know, we, uh, you spend nights all over the world, quite literally. And you can ask any loadmaster, and they'll tell you that's probably the best job they ever had. We like to say we had uh, college-educated pilots flying us all over the world, and bar to bar, whatever, having fun. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of a lot of hard work. You'd 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 work 18, 20-hour days, get eight hours off, and do it all over again. Uh, of course, when you're in your mid twenties, young twenties, like I was, you thought you were Superman. You could do anything, and uh, you know, you just you just ran with it. Uh, at my age now, I couldn't even consider doing something like that. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, but we hauled all kind of. If you if you can think of it, we hauled it into Vietnam. We hauled people out. Like I said, we haul we haul people out in caskets. A lot of them. We we haul guns, ammunition food, Christmas trees, we take it in and you never know what you were going to bring out until they, you land, they tell you, okay, you got to take this out. And uh, it, it was, it was fun. You always got to meet a lot of people. Actually, I was walking down, the, I picked up a load of people out of Tonchanut and uh, they're loaded on the airplane. And I'm walking down the aisle of the airplane. There said a guy I graduated from high school with. Oh you know, uh, Jimmy Frank Counts is his name. You might know him. Yeah. Jimmy Frank. And mm -hmm. uh, he was sitting on the airplane. Wow. And he said, Wow, Jack, how you doing? And I hadn't seen him since we graduated in 64. And this was in the 70s. You know, so. Uh, Jack, what. What has serving in the military meant to you in it, your later life? It. I wish all my kids went in the military. I wish my grandkids would go in the military. It's something you will never understand 
unless you do it. Now, like I told you, I wanted to go in real bad because my dad was in. I wanted to go in real bad because I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see things I had seen in magazines, you know. Uh, when I, one of my assignments was, my first assignment was Korea. But remember I was told you I was a typewriter jockey? The name of the typewriter was Remington. <laughs> so we used to tell everybody we were the Remington Raiders, you know. <laughs> and I left there, I went to Germany, and I got over there, and my cousin, who I went, took to the airport here and grew up with here, he was an air traffic controller in Frankfurt, and I worked in Wiesbaden. So we were, had it all set, we're coming back home together, and we were gonna come back same time, get out of the military. Well, I met a girl. <laughs> so a he came. Girl. He came back <laughs> and got out, and I, uh, I stayed, got married, and our anniversary of 53 years was just last week. Uh, got three kids, and uh, they we were stationed uh, in a lot of places. I counted once that my wife and I have lived in 22 places around the world different houses and mm -hmm. homes because of the military moving us around. What's your favorite? Well, England was great, <laughs> but uh, how can I not say Germany? Cause that's where we met my wife, you know? <laughs> and then, but she, it kind of, it was rough at times because like I said, we were in California and I'd be gone for a couple of weeks at a time. And, you know, she was alone with the kids and they were just, they weren't even old enough to be in school. They were still preschoolers at the time, so. But she was a trooper and stuck it out with me, and uh, you know. So. From my, Germany to here, what does she think about Fayetteville, Lincoln County? The only place to shop is Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we lived in Dallas, and we had you could they had tons of stores everywhere, big shopping centers, and and here it's like you know you gotta got to go to Walmart or go to Huntsville but uh, you know 53 years 52 years I think I said and uh, but I wouldn't change my experience of the military for nothing in the world it's got not just for the benefits I mean what a lot of we had a little meeting over at the high school one day and we had all we set up our tables and talked to high school kids about joining the military and stuff and most of them were uh, the cadets in pips class over there and then a lot of them said they're going in and they asked us what's what what happens after you get out after 20 years and you know if i give them an example i say you know my wife's had a couple of surgeries and it don't cost me a penny <laughs> you know it costs you for medicare a hundred and four dollars a month I think it is but Uncle Sam picks up the rest of it for us people that spent 20 years in the military uh, that's a huge benefit uh, right now uh, we got a lot of members ex-military that belong to the VFW and American Legion over here and you know we all get together once a month matter of fact I have a meeting there today when we get out of here uh, I didn't ask for the job, but they voted me in as a commander, you know, I guess because nobody else would do it probably. <laughs> but, but you're uh, a good one. But, what, uh, what was it like when you came back from, um, how was you treated? Well, I never had any issues because when you, if you in the army go over, you might, the whole regiment might go over and they all come back and, you know, everybody knows you're coming back in Vietnam. I came back for Vietnam every week, or every two weeks. And then one day they just said, okay, you're going to England. So I took off to England. It wasn't like, but I know one thing though, it was many, many years before I started wearing, this is not a Vietnam hat, it's a veteran's hat, but I seen a friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Pendergrass one day, he had a Viet, Mom hat on. He said, Jack, how come you don't wear a Vietnam hat? You're a veteran. And I thought about that. And I go, you're right. How come I'm not wearing a hat? I went and got one. I wear one all the time. <laughs> it says something about military or Vietnam or 
or something all the time. Don Jackson. And I wear it with pride now. He's also on our uh, Friends of Fayetteville Lincoln County Veterans Board for the Warrior Exhibit. What'd you do after you got back to the States? You mean when I got discharged? Yeah, when you went to work. I, I left England for the second time and we got stationed in Florida. And, I, and when I retired out of the military in 84 in Florida, I had an interview in Dallas, Texas with MCI and they hired me out there because uh, my experience. Let me let me digress a minute. When I was a loadmaster, I busted up my knee playing racquetball, and the doctor let me fly. He he he, he didn't want to, but he let me fly. I'd beg off every time. I said, "Oh, doc, I'm okay. I'm just fine." <clears throat> well, when you're when you're an air crew member, you have to go through an altitude chamber, and they pressurize it. And they, they pressurize it so you're up to, you know, thousands and thousands of feet up. And you got an oxygen mask on. And uh, he'll tell you, you're going to have a lot of gas. And there's only two ways that come out of your body. And you're sitting on one of them and you cover it here <laughs> with the other one, you know. And uh, so they depressurize. We start coming down. And one time when I did it, I told them to stop. Stop. My head was hurting so bad, I couldn't stand it. And uh, he said, well, you got to clear your ears. And we tried everything. Of course, they're outside the chamber. I'm inside the chamber. And they, uh, I could never get it cleared. And my head was killing me. And he said, Jack, there's nothing else we can do. We got to come down. We can't, we just can't stay here all day or all night and keep you pressurized. So they came down and I went straight to the flight surgeon's office. They did x-rays. And if you ever remember seeing the old bellows pumps like in the mm -hmm. in the fireplace and stuff, he had one with a mask on it. He put it over my face and it went pow and my ears went pow. Oh wow. He cleared my ears. Wow. But then he showed me the x rays. He said, Right here, you see that big old spot looks as big as a plum? I go, Yeah, what is that? He said, That's your sinuses. You're grounded. You never fly again. Wow. Oh. He said, Your knees I can let you do it. You can get away with it. He said, that could kill you if it was to rupture on an airplane sometime. Wow. So I got out of that. And but crossed you flew a whole lot, though, before Oh, yeah. This. How yeah, many years did you fly before that, that happened? I don't know how that just happened to show up that time, but that grounded me. So I cross-trained into telecommunications. And back then, you know, the Internet was getting started, telecommunications. Communications was hot and heavy, and so I did that my last trip to England and in Florida. So when I was getting out of Florida, I applied out in Dallas, Texas. They hired me while I was still in the military because of my telecommunication experience. So I went to Dallas and and uh, spent 15 years out there with them, and uh, moved back down here. Now today I live on the farm where I grew up. Uh, my mom and dad bought it in 1960, and when they passed away, they kind of left it to me and my brother, so that's where we're at today. How long did you fly before you were grounded? Uh, from 72 to 78. Uh, mm -hmm. The three years in Dallas, I mean, in California, we're flying to Vietnam, and then they sent me to England in 75 and stayed there from 75 to 78. And it was the latter part of 78, just a few months before I was coming back to the States, that I got grounded because of my, uh, my sinuses. Met a lot of people over those years. Oh, gosh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I talk to a lot of people on Facebook now that I knew when I was in the military and I used to fly with, and, you know, technology is wonderful. You can get on the phone and face to face with my friends in Germany. You know, my wife talks to her kinfolk in Germany all the time. Wow. You know, and it's uh, pretty amazing yeah. how that works. But uh, I never had any any stories that <clears throat> where we were in a life or death situation. None of that. You know, some amusing stories every now and then. That's but good. it was it was fun. We did a good job. <clears throat> I had a one time one of my passengers on the plane was Chuck Yeager. You know, he, he's the guy that broke the sound barrier, and he was asking me, 
what do you like about flying? I said, well, I used to be a typewriter jockey, and I wanted to give more to the Air Force and the military, so I crossed into the, into the flying, and I love it. And uh, he said, well, that's good. I'm glad, you know, you do what you want to do, and if you have a good sense of uh, accomplishment there, you're, you're doing a good job, you know. Absolutely. So uh, you got to meet a, he was, uh, I guess, looking back, he was the only celebrity I ever met or remember meeting. I'm telling you that. It was 40-something years ago <laughs> when I was in Vietnam. And uh, he, uh, but we, you know, we'd fly over and one thing about being as a crew member, if you had a crash somewhere, we always got briefed, you know, and it wasn't, wasn't good to hear about crashes and people dying and stuff. And, you know, one of my good friends left California and went up to uh, Alaska, flying C-131s. They crashed. He died. You just never know. I'm not going to say you never go know what is your turn, but you know, airplanes flying is kind of dangerous. You know, you ever, it's forgiving when you're up there and you have problems. Yeah. It's, Were you ever concerned? You ever get close or have I used to have dreams. I had, I had, I guess you call them nightmares. I'm sure I would too. But. <laughs> In my dreams, I was the only survivor. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? That's a good dream. I dream, and we, if there was crashes, I mean, like I said, when you're crew members in a flying squadron and you hear about a crash, you get briefed about it. You know, 141s, we had two crashes in one day. One of them was in Terry Hone, Spain. They hit a mountain. It's all, you can look it up, it's on the internet. The, everybody died except for one navigator. Uh, sometimes in, on long trips, you'll have a double crew, you know, two navigators, two co-pilots, two pilots, two, nav two load masters. He was thrown free and uh, lived. That same day, the other one was in uh, Greenland, I think, and they crashed the same day, two in one day. So it what happened. Call, what caused them to crash, <clears throat> you know? Well, the one in Terre Haute, Spain, they, uh, they had been up for... 18, 20 hours on that flight, the flight before, the day before, until they're getting crew rest. The story is they went out sightseeing and, and then they, they took off with a little rest. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they misunderstood the clearance level coming down and they hit the top of a mountain. You could see the runway in front of you, but they still hit the mountain. And they really bad, they had, uh, they had dependents on there civilians flying in to, to be with their families and stuff and uh, then there was there was one flying to England one day uh, it might I may have the two mixed up it's been a long time maybe the one in England and the one in Terre Haute no no it, it wasn't but the one in England with flew through a thunderstorm and <clears throat> quite literally blew apart the air wow. and they all died and I was stationed in England in a pararescue outfit at that time, you know. So we, we flew up looking around for them and stuff. But now, what is a pararescue? Pararescues are, are the Air Force version of the baddest dudes on the planet, if you ask them. Uh, they, you know, like Green Berets in the Army, mm -hmm. all the training they go through, uh, the Navy SEALs, that, all the training they go through. Well, the pararescues, short PJs for short, they go through, they'll tell you just as much training as the other two outfits also. Uh, and their training goes on for, I don't know, months and months and months and months before they ever get finished with it. And they're, uh, they're, they're a special group of people. I wasn't a pararescue guy. I was a guy on an airplane that flew with them, and they jumped out of my airplane, you know. Oh. Or we'd go flying around looking for ships missing ships or down airplanes and stuff like that and if you find one they would jump out and go down and help their survivors wow. you know they always told me that jack one day we're going to throw you out you're going with us <laughs> i believed them that's just they would you know that's you know i didn't know whether to stand way back or make sure i had my parachute <laughs> on or what but they kept saying we're going to drag you out with us one day but they never did, thank goodness, you know. And probably didn't. Yeah, yeah. probably didn't, really? too, you know. 
uh, but when you're in with the pararescue guys, that's what you do. You fly around on C-130s, and they uh, one of the uh, tell everybody what a C-130 is. What's it look like? It's a four-engine prop airplane, you know, where the, the 141s is a four-engine jet, okay. and the 140, 130 is what the par we used in England for the pararescues. That's what you zone mostly, C-130. Who, me? Yeah. Well, I was on those from 75 to 78. I was on the C-141 from 72 to 75, so gotcha. pretty much close to equal time. Uh, one of the pararescue guys uh, is a Medal of Honor winner. There's probably several, but, you know, everybody heard about him over in Vietnam. And uh, there's only been one, uh, one loadmaster. He was uh, won the Medal of Honor. He was the youngest, youngest enlisted guy, I think I'm saying it right, uh, in the Air Force to win the Medal of Honor. And unfortunately, he finally passed away a couple years ago. Was it loud inside there where you were working in the back? Say what? Was it loud? <laughs> <laughs> Must have yes, been. it was loud. We had to have, <laughs> you, we had headsets, but you know, you, you take them off all the time. We had little pink earplugs we put in it looked like bubble gum you know i hate to say it but sometimes you have a lot of people on the airplane and you especially if they didn't speak english and you hand it to them and they're like what and you go you know <laughs> trying to make them think it's earplugs mm -hmm. but you actually make them think it's chewing gum and they'll oh. throw it about and chew it. Oh, we get a kick out of that. But that was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was bad. Well, now the interior of the planes were they? Did they have seats in them, or was it down the side? If, uh, if no, it was down the sides mostly. If on the C one forty one you were uh, hauling a hundred passengers or more, there'd be seats facing aft, facing backward. Okay. And then up front, we'd have a big, huge. We call it a comfort pallet that was slid in first and bolted down, tied down. And uh, we'd have, uh, there'd be a restroom in it. There'd be stoves. You know, I cook. If you got 150 people on the airplane, you got to feed them. <laughs> I you know, know about that. I was like a stewardess. You had to feed everybody. And, uh, and I, another thing I tell people today, you know, you have air marshals today. Mm-hmm. I'm jumping around a little bit, but you have air marshals today. Back in the 70s, I was an air marshal before they call them air marshals. <laughs> if you remember in the 70s, they started having a lot of hijackings around the world, mm -hmm. you know, overseas and everywhere. So myself and a flying engineer was issued a pistol. And our standing command from, a, from our generals was, your plane will not be hijacked. You will shoot the guy. If you have a hijack in your plane, you will not let him hijack your airplane. It never, I never had to shoot anybody, you know, thank goodness. But the bullets we had looked like a tube of lipstick. It had a plastic cover over the end of it, and inside was little bean bags. That, that was the purpose was, if you had a big heavy lead bullet and you shot somebody, it'd go right to them and go out the airplane yeah. and you would decompress. Yeah. So, you shoot them with a big bag, I guess they thought it would just make a big hole in them and not go all the way through them. Huh. So I tell people today when they talk about air marshals, I'm like, oh, me and my buddies, we were air marshals before you <laughs> call them air marshals, you know, and, and which is true. Now, what is the purpose of the seats being facing backwards? I, I don't know that for sure. I have no idea. On, seems on, odd, on regular airplanes, they all face forward. Yeah. But these are all facing backwards, you know, and you know when you're bored you know you guys would take a can of pea soup and act like it's throwing it up in a plastic bag and ask the army guys pass this up we get rid of this <laughs> it was long flights sometimes you had to do something to, you yeah. know i mean c-130s the, the, those aircraft they stay up in the air a long time uh yeah you you know refuel and when I was in England, one of our big missions would, would go leave Woodbridge Air Base and fly to Keflavik, Iceland. 
so it made it that way all the time we uh we were flying up there one time and I looked out the window and i told the, the call up front i said god we got we're leaking gas there's fuel coming out of the one engine and of course we all come back and look the co-pilot looked and boy just a big stream of, of gas so they said well call back to woodbridge get to headquarters and ask them what we should do so they call back down to the which is they got radios you know they call back to woodbridge and jay answered the phone and says i'll just keep going <laughs> so we we thought about that a while and they go well they didn't even ask anything what they didn't ask how serious it is and once if you're not halfway you turn around it's quicker to get back than if you're over halfway yeah, right. it's quicker to go forward so the commander calls back down there again and found out a guy in there sweeping up answered the phone <laughs> true story Ooh. and he just oh keep going and, and so what did you do we kept going by then it was done too late to turn around <laughs> but you made it okay oh yeah we made it okay and what was wrong with the gas deal? oh i don't know but they fixed it and we flew it we stayed when you go to iceland would stay a week and fly rescue missions and I'll fly all around and stuff and then after a week come back and somebody else would go. Our rotation, you go about once every six weeks to Iceland and stay up there. So it you're a really a prime example of somebody that went in the service, served 20 years and came out with uh, the skills that you had in the service and made the rest of your life's work with it. I did. I did. Uh, that's awesome. I tell kids that, or I did yeah. when I was teaching. And the benefits, there's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. People, people don't know about them because they've never done it, you know. But uh, it's always good stories, always bad stories. There's always, you know, people getting hurt, you know. You know, me, I never got a scratch on me except. Yeah. Well, Barroom you know, brawls, that don't count, you yeah. know. <laughs> but uh, I had a few friends that get hurt, you know, a few friends that died in airplane crashes and stuff. And uh, when it happens, it happens. When that C-5 went down on the baby lift, I had a friend on there that uh, didn't make it, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just flying is... I guess it's, you say it's a little dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> but when I fly today on a, when I fly today on a, a civilian airline, I'm thinking, I have no control here. <laughs> I have no control. I'm stuck in this seat, but I always ask for a window seat because I know I can open that emergency exit, you know. But when you were on your own airplane and you were a crew member, you had control of everything, you know. You knew what to do. You're a team. You knew, in, in, in case of emergency, you knew what your job was. And it's not like you're stuck on a regular airplane and hope the pilot and the rest of the crew know what they're doing to get you off, you know. So it's a, I would encourage, and I do, I, I encourage kids. I talked to this kid at public supermarket and he asked me about the Air Force. And I said, yeah, I talked to him and tell him about it. And I went down there one day and he said, Guess what? I go, what? He said, I joined the Air Force. Uh -huh. I said, you're going to love it. That makes you feel You're going to yeah. love it, yeah, it you does. know. Uh, I got, I came this close to joining the Navy, you know. But when I took my first cousin to the bus station right down here, he went to the Air Force. And uh, I, it, really, it really hurt me. Not only was it my first cousin, he was my best friend. And so... I followed him. I told my mom and dad, I'm joining the Air Force. I'm, I'm going tomorrow to join, and I did. Next thing you know, I'm in basic training, going, what the heck is here? <laughs> Was basic it. training hard? Actually, I didn't think so. I, uh, you know, you live on a farm. You grow up in Tennessee. How hard, can, how hard can work be? Yeah. Swing it out over the lake, you know, here. Well, they, we had to swing out over the water and drop in the water and swim. I, we thought that was pretty easy. You had to, some things I really enjoyed about it, we got to go to the rifle range a lot. You know, golly, you grew up in Tennessee, you grew up with a gun. <laughs> so I'm on the rifle range. 
and I shoot, and we're all lined up. <clears throat> and that drill instructor says, where are you from, boy? I was like, Tennessee, sir. He says, everybody gather around. The Tennessee boy's going to show you how to shoot. <laughs> he said, here, do that again, what you just did. I shot again. Because, gosh, shooting was yeah. second nature when you grew up with guns. And uh, he uh, said, now that's how you do it. Tennessee boys know how to do that. <clears throat> and I thought that was a one-off. We got to England years later. And remember I told you I carried a gun. It was a 38, and it was in a shoulder holster. Nobody saw it, but you had to go, ooh, you had to, go uh, to the shooting range and qualify all the time. It was on the range one day, and the guy goes, everybody stop. Stop what you're doing. We have the two best shots on the base here today. Buck and I can't remember the other kid's name, but he was a guy in my squadron. He said, we're going to have a shoot-off. <laughs> so we did. He beat me, you know. So, But it was just that kind of recognition. It's, it's fun to have, you know, knowing you can do it right. You got anything else? No. You got anything else you'd like to say? No, I, you know, all the kids today, I think they ought to bring the draft back and let them go through military training and you come out and you've got a, you've got a good head on your shoulders. And when I was hiring people in MCI, when, when the dot com was hot and heavy, I hired a lot of military guys because they they just got it together for the most mm -hmm. part, you know, and uh, they they worked out great, and uh, I had never had any regrets about hiring military guys, and I'm glad I did. And some of them are pretty high up in the organization now. Makes you feel good. Very good. Air Force veteran, uh, Vietnam veteran Jack Buck's been our guest today. We appreciate you telling our telling the story. We appreciate your service. Thank you very much. Glad to do it. Linda glad Williams. to do it. Linda Williams here, and uh, I'm Don Counts, and we'll see you back in here next time. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.